Now, on one of those days, Jesus and his disciples got into a boat, and he said to them, Let's, Let us go over to the other side of the lake. So they launched out. But as they were sailing along, he fell asleep. And a fierce gale of wind descended on the lake, and they began to be swamped and to be in danger. They came to Jesus and woke him up, saying, Master, Master, we're perishing. <clears throat> and he got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves, and they stopped, and it became calm. And he said to them, Where is your faith? They were fearful and amazed, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? The children are staying here with us. This morning is really part two of last week's message, um, and uh, most of you were here for it. We do have it on our YouTube channel if you want to go back and watch it. But last week, we ended with this picture um, painted by a famous painter by the name of Rembrandt. And we know that he got this story because he painted himself into the picture. If you count the people on the boat, there's Jesus and 13 disciples. And Rembrandt painted a picture of himself smack dab in the middle of the storm, smack dab in the middle of the boat. And he's looking out at us, kind of asking us, what are you going to do? How are you going to respond to the storm? As I mentioned last week, I love the moment that Rembrandt picks to paint this picture, the, the snapshot that he decides to take. Because he paints the picture when the storm is still raging. The storm is still completely out of control. The boat is just about to capsize from this one massive wave. Um, some of the disciples are panicking, still trying to mess with the sail and the oars. One of them, I don't think you can see it too well, it's in the darker section of the picture here, is losing his lunch over the side of the boat. A few of the disciples are panicking and have finally gotten to that moment um, where they're running to Jesus and saying, you have to help us. But as we saw last week, it's only the power of Jesus that can turn panic into peace. And here, what makes this picture so amazing is that peace is just seconds away. If you just, if this was a video, you would just have to blink, and in just a second, it's going to be completely calm lake that this boat is sitting on. The storm's going to be over. Now, I'm not exactly sure what expression Rembrandt gives himself here in his self-portrait, but he seems to be calm. It's like he knows what's about to happen. And you can imagine if there was some possibility that you could be transported back in time onto this boat and you realized you were on the, disciple, on the boat with the disciples and with Jesus in the middle of the storm, I think you would pretty quickly go to the fact of, wait a second, I read this story in the Bible, right? Hopefully, maybe you would think back, I heard a sermon about this one time. You know what's about to happen. Maybe you would still, hopefully you would still row and help bail out some of the water. Hopefully you would have the recommendation earlier than the disciples did of, hey, let's go to Jesus and wake him up. He can help us with this. But overall, you wouldn't have the same panic that the disciples did. I just want to submit to you this morning that we are all with Rembrandt in the middle of the storm. We have different storms, different trials, different struggles, different feel, fear, different pain. But we can have peace. Why? Because we know the end of this story specifically? Well, not exactly, because we don't know exactly when our storm is going to be over. 
We don't know when Jesus is going to calm the storm. But the reason that we can have peace is that we have the same Jesus with us. In the boat of life, we have the same Savior. So no matter how bad the storm looks, and even though we don't know when exactly or how exactly he's going to calm the storm, here's what we do know. Jesus is with us. Jesus' first reaction is to ask the disciples, where is your faith? What are you counting on? What are you relying on to get you through the storm? And there's really no way to read through this passage of Scripture without being confronted with the fact that a lot of times we are counting on the wrong things. And we talked about that last week. But for the disciples, the response is worship. It says they were fearful and amazed. And they were saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? Think about this moment of awe for the disciples. They knew Jesus. This wasn't their first boat trip with Jesus, right? They'd seen Jesus do miracles. They'd seen him preach sermons. They'd seen him end funerals and feed the 5,000 and cast out demons. And so when Jesus was asleep in the boat, they thought they knew who they had there. They thought they knew what they had there. But it turns out that suddenly they get a new view of their Savior. Suddenly they realize who they are in the presence of. There's really only one answer to this question. There's only one being in all the universe that can command winds and water. There's only one power in the universe that can stop a storm, and that's God. So what do they do? What's their response? Worship. And that's how Luke ends this whole account. Just leaves us with the disciples in awe of Jesus on the boat. And that's where the story ends. Because that's where we all are. We are at the place where if you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, you can worship him. You can be in his presence with fear and amazement. Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon where the title and the theme of his message was simply this. There is an admirable conjunction of excellency, of diverse excellencies in Jesus Christ. It was a sermon on Revelation 5 about how Jesus is the lion and the lamb. How could one being in the universe, when you get a glimpse of them, could they be a lion and a lamb at the same time? And, and Edwards preaches a fantastic message. You can read it online if you want to. But here in this text, we are confronted with these different characteristics of Jesus that we could never imagine coming together in one person. Somebody has said that this verse, these few verses here in Luke, this one story, is one of the best evidences of Jesus' humanity and his divinity in the same place. Jesus is fully human. He falls asleep, just like you do and I do at the end of a long day. Jesus had probably been preaching all day. It had been probably a long, uh, difficult time of ministry and that time. And Jesus falls asleep. And not just a little light cat nap, like you might get every once in a while in the afternoon. Jesus is out cold. He's a human being. And at the exact same time, Jesus is God. And he is in absolute, complete control of every single molecule of that storm. There is not a gust of wind there is not a unit of energy. There is not an ounce of water that was outside of Jesus' control. So you say, wait a second, how do those two things go together? How could Jesus be sleeping in the boat and in absolute control at the exact same time? And my answer to you is, I have no idea. There are a diverse conjunction of excellencies in Jesus Christ. There is no one like him in all the universe. That is why he deserves to be worshipped above all else. 
You will find no one and nothing else in the universe worthy of worship like Jesus Christ. Theologians have spent plenty of pages trying to explain how these things can go together. And at the end, all you're really left with is mystery. That Jesus is fully human and fully God. But I would submit to you that what you're really left with is this is the guy you want in your boat. Right? How it all works together, I'm not sure. But you better make sure that you know him. And that you're in a right relationship with him. Because when the storms of life hit, he is the one person who you need with you. There is no one else like him. There's one other thing that we talk about these different conjunction of excellencies with Jesus. All these amazing characteristics that intersect with him and just leads us to worship him. But there's another mystery here that is included, and that is why did Jesus have them go into this storm at all? If Jesus is powerful enough to stand up and just tell the storm, be still, and it's super quiet, the waves are gone, the wind is gone, then why didn't Jesus, just as soon as the first drop hit them uh, you know, on, the, on the nose, uh, just stand up and stop it then? Why was it, it was Jesus' idea to get up and go across the lake? That was, that was Jesus' intention all the way. Did, if he's strong enough to stop the storm, why didn't he just say, hey guys, this isn't a great day for sailing. We're going to hang out here on this side of the lake. How did, if Jesus is all powerful, then how is it that he didn't stop it earlier? The whole question of good and evil, of course, again, it's another thing, been debated by philosophers and theologians, and I'm not going to try and go into all those different arguments and answers here, but I'll just say that what makes Christianity unique is that Jesus shows up to suffer with us. We don't know why God does what he does. There's all sorts of things that happen in our lives that make absolutely no sense. And we look at a storm, at some kind of a trial, some kind of suffering, and we say, there is no good here. Can't see it. It's impossible. But if Jesus is in the boat with you, then you can't really say there's no good possible because you have Jesus with you. So you say, well, it seems like Jesus isn't answering. It seems like Jesus is asleep. Where is he? If he's he's with me, why hasn't he woken up and stopped the storm yet? And all we can really say is, we don't know. He's Jesus. He's God. He, He can do whatever he wants. But what we do know is that he's with us. He is in the boat with us. Every other religion has some kind of God that sends storms or is in some kind of control in the storms. But Christianity is the only one that you have where Jesus shows up and is with us in the storm. So Jesus, in one sense, does send the storm, and yet at the same time, Jesus is the one that promises to go through the storm with us. And how all those things go together, we have to say, I don't really know. But we do know Jesus is with us. He's promised to be with us to the end. Jesus is going to go all the way to the cross and experience ultimate suffering, take our sin on himself and experience even death. So that's the whole message of Christianity is that Jesus shows up with us. Remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego where they get thrown into the fire. And what happens? Someone shows up in the fire with them. So there's someone like the Son of Man. That's what what Jesus does. So we, we don't know why Jesus is doing what he's doing. We don't know why Jesus didn't wake up earlier and just stop the storm. So that part of the Christian response to suffering is faith. It's stopping to say, I don't know when the storm is going to stop. I don't even know why the storm is here completely, but I do know who I have with me in the middle of the storm. And that's why Jesus turns to them at the end of this and says to them, where is your faith? What are you counting on? What are you relying on to get you through the storm? 
So do you really believe that Jesus is with you? Right now in the storm that you're going through, do you believe that you have him in your boat? As we mentioned already, we're going to do something a little different in the service this morning because I really feel that as we look at this story and as we look at this text, the only real response to this is just to worship, to just sit underneath of who this Jesus is and praise him for being such a savior. So we're going to do that in just a minute. But as we, as we go into this time, let me just say two things. One possibility is that you're in the storm this morning and you don't have Jesus in your boat. It's possible that you've been living your own life. You've been going your own way. You've been doing your own thing. So the reason that the storm feels so chaotic and out of control is because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. So that's one possibility that you have to consider as, as we think about this. I don't want to give promises that are inappropriate or shouldn't be given. If you've never turned your heart over to Christ, you've never repented of your sin and given your life to him, then do that today. And you can have this promise that he's always going to be with you. So that's the first thing. And secondly, let me just say, as we sing these songs and as we worship Jesus now, realize that Jesus is speaking to you. Jesus is in the storm that you're going through right now. We have to put ourselves like Rembrandt in the picture, right? Of, it's not just that, yeah, Jesus helps people with storms in general out there, but I'm saying that this morning, the storm you're in right now, Jesus is with you. Amy Carmichael said this, Thou art the Lord who slept upon the pillow. Thou art the Lord who soothed the furious sea. What matter beating wind and tossing billow if only we are in the boat with thee? What matter beating wind and tossing billow if only we are in the boat with thee. I hope you're in the boat with Jesus this morning. Let's spend some time now worshiping this wonderful Jesus who is in the boat with us. Before we sing the second group of point really quickly. The disciples start this text, they start this story being fearful and amazed at a storm. But in just a few short verses later, the disciples are still fearful and amazed, but they're fearful and amazed of Jesus. They went from being in the presence of the storm to being in the presence of the one who made the storm. J.C. Ryle comments on this text, and he says this, The lesson here is one of deep practical importance. To have true saving faith is one thing. To have the faith that is always ready for use is quite another. Many receive Christ as their Savior and deliberately commit their souls to him for time and eternity. That's what I've been saying is having Jesus in the boat with you. But, he says, they often find their faith sadly lacking when something unexpected happens and they are tested. The best way for a Christian to live is to copy Moses' example who persevered because he saw him who is invisible. That person will never greatly be shaken by any storm. He will see Jesus near him in the darkest hour and blue sky behind the blackest cloud. In other words, our problem is that in the storm, all we can see is the storm. It isn't just that our bodies are busy rowing and bailing water. The part of the problem with the storm is that our hearts get fearful. We're in awe of the storm. But Jesus' plan is to display his power so that we are in awe of him, so that we're in his presence. It wasn't wrong for the disciples to be in the storm, but they started to panic in the storm when they got their eyes off of Jesus. You remember the similar story when Jesus is walking on water and Peter is the one with faith that says, you know, let me go out there and walk with you, Jesus. And Jesus has him come out. Peter's walking on the water. But what happened? Peter got his eyes off 
of Jesus. J.C. Ryle mentioned Moses. And you remember that in Exodus 33, Moses had been told by God to lead the people of Israel. And Moses, who had been talking to God this whole time, Moses says, God, I'm not going until I see you. Moses, even though he's been in conversation with God already all this time, says, show me your glory. I have to see something new about you before I can take the next step. Hebrews says that Moses persevered because he saw him who was invisible. You think about that statement, on one level it makes no sense. How can you see something or someone who's invisible? But when you're talking about faith, about trusting Christ in the storm, that's exactly what you're doing. In the middle of amazing storms, our only hope is to get a glimpse of our amazing God. You have to see him for yourself. Something real has to happen between your soul and God. And that's what happens here. And the way that Luke purposely leaves us with this story is with the disciples being in awe, not of the storm anymore, but in awe of the power of God. In the trials that you go through, you already see the trial. You already know about the trial. What you need is something bigger than the trial. You need something bigger than the storm. You have to, with your, with your heart faith, see something that is invisible. You have to have a characteristic of God, something about his power, something about his goodness, um, something about his love that you are holding on to that's going to get you through the storm. Another way of saying this is that you just need a glimpse of Jesus. If Jesus is in the boat with you and you're trusting him, every storm in your life is going to be different. It doesn't mean you're not going to have storms. We've already talked about that. You're going to have storms in your life. It's just a matter of are you going to face them with Jesus in the boat with you or not? It doesn't mean it's always going to be easy or simple, but it does mean that even in the storm, you're going to see Jesus. Think about any of the past storms in your life that you've been through. Many times, most Christians will be able to look back at storms in their life and say, but look how Jesus was with me. Look at that storm, but also you wouldn't believe how Jesus was with me in that storm. Think about how the disciples would have looked back on this storm, right? They didn't remember how high the waves were. They didn't remember how nasty the wind was. They look back at the storm and they see how Jesus was with them in the storm and how he calmed it. They didn't look back and think about the other disciples in the storm. Think through, I mean, we all know, I said this downstairs a minute ago, we all know Judas he wasn't pulling his weight when it came to rowing and, you know, bailing out water. And we all know Peter was probably being a jerk during this storm. Peter was the bossy guy, probably telling everybody what to do. But I don't think they looked back on it and said, man, remember, remember what they did? What did they look back on this? They didn't look back on it and see it as the other disciples and what they did. They looked back on it and said, but look what Jesus did. Look how he carried me. Look how he walked with me. Look what I learned about him. If you're going through a storm right now, you have to go to Jesus, right? That's what the disciples learned here. You're hoping and you're praying for the storm to stop, but at the same time, you know that you have Jesus with you right now. If you're a Christian, Jesus has experienced any category of suffering that you could possibly experience, and he's promised to be with us always, even until the end of the world. So yes, the storm is raging, but you need time where you drop everything else and you go and you talk to him and you spend time in his presence. Maybe you're seeing a storm on the horizon and you have caught the first glimpse of the, the, those dark clouds that you think might be coming towards you. But if that's true and those what-ifs are starting to run through your mind, If you're a Christian, you're not going to face a storm without Jesus. It's absolutely impossible. 
He's promised to never leave us or forsake us. So when you anticipate that storm, sometimes, of course, we, we spend more time worrying about storms that never even happen. But maybe you're right. Maybe that storm is coming. But you're not going to face a storm without Jesus if you know him. At the end of the day, you're not designed to be in awe of storms. We're not designed to worship trials. You're designed to be in awe of Jesus. You're designed to worship him. And that's your only hope to get through the storm. So if Jesus is in your boat, that's good. That's great. There's no other place you want him. But realize that's just the beginning. You still need more of him. The disciples thought that they knew Jesus. They thought that they had Jesus all figured out. Yep, we're following Jesus. He's powerful. He's got it. But in the storm, they saw an aspect of Jesus that they never would have been able to see otherwise. So in the storm, yes, we need the storm to stop, and we're waiting for him to do that. But what we really need is more of Jesus, a new glimpse of him. Other Christians help us with that, obviously, are the songs that we're singing point us in that direction. But ultimately, it's something that the Holy Spirit does through the Word of God. You have to get time alone with God in His presence, in His Word, where you encounter God for yourself. Because you weren't meant to worship storms. You were meant to worship Him. To be fearful and amazed at His greatness. So we're going to spend the rest of our time now worshiping this one who is bigger than any storm. Because more than anything, we need a glimpse of him.